One of the biggest surges in popularity for the World Rally Championship came in the late 90s to early noughties, particularly in the UK, where everyone was rightly going berserk with the likes of Colin McRae and Richard Burns. However, most of the other drivers were not far off being household names, and this popularity globally culminated in several manufacturers competing in the series. And the good news was, loads of manufacturers were in with the shouts of victory at most rallies. One brand, though, was also hoping to get a piece of the action. Hyundai have been mainstays of the World Rally scene since 2014, and since 2017 have not finished worse than second in the manufacturer standings, with the team also claiming first place in 2019 and 20. However, this was not their first foray into rallying. The brand entered into the same championship in 1998 that these days we would call the WRC2 category, except back then it had a really snappy name called the FIA 2 litre World Rally Cup. After a partial campaign in that year, a full-blown assault would develop in 1999, and with a Hyundai Coupe kit car Evo 2, it nearly got the championship. Second place in the manufacturer standings behind Renault. However, this was just to get a taster for the big leagues, and in 2000, Hyundai would duly do so. Entering the main World Rally Championship, the base car that Hyundai would use was the Accent, a vehicle that in its lifetime was voted by Top Gear to be the worst car of 2004. Well, that's hardly a rousing way to get started. But this was no ordinary Hyundai Accent. The WRC version would barely share any components with its road-going counterpart. It would be developed by a British firm called Motorsport Developments, the same team that ran the company's 2-litre World Rally campaign. And for those of you who love your statistics, here are some juicy details about this car. A 2-litre turbocharged engine that put out 300 horsepower and 520 newton meters of torque, all going through to the four wheels via a six-speed sequential gearbox with a weight to carry of 1,230 kilograms. And then there were the pilots. Firstly, Kenneth Erickson, an experienced man with Subaru and Mitsubishi equipment and had collected six WRC victories up to this point. His teammate Alistair McRae, the younger brother of Colin, who was also pretty handy behind the wheel. Both drivers were driven for Hyundai in the 2-litre championship the year prior, so the familiarity of everything was of course a bonus. Plus, with all the years of competing that Kenneth had, he seemed like the ideal driver to try and help develop the car as the year went on. On their prospects for its debut season, the drivers had this to say, I'm fairly confident we've got a good package there, but we need to work with that package. The car's going to get better throughout the year, I just hope that we're reasonably competitive to start with, and we've got reliability. It's a lot of potential there. Handling is fantastic on the car, really nice. So with the team having spent millions of currency on making this program, let's crack on and see how the team did in the first round of Monte Carlo. Or not, as they didn't show up, but that was intentional. Instead, the car's debut was in Sweden. Brilliant conditions for Kenneth, being a Swede himself and having won the event three separate times. Obviously, even with this level of time behind the wheel, a win was very much not on the cards. The team would probably be satisfied if they got both cars to the end of the rally without any issues. And they would indeed complete the rally. Not without issues though. In fact, the issues would start almost immediately. The first stage of the rally, and Ericsson's turbo had decided to no longer function properly. Then Alistair's machine would also develop the same issue later on in the rally. Both drivers would end the first day just inside the top 20 but by the end of the rally, the team would be setting stage times regularly in the top 10, and wouldn't suffer any further mechanical woes. At rally's end, Kenneth was 13th, Alistair 14th, both under 9 minutes off the winner. Kenya was skipped, but round 4 in Portugal wasn't. This was seen as the first rally where Hyundai could gauge where the accent was compared to its rivals. Alistair said, We'll get a good idea by the end of this of where we are against the other cars. Unfortunately, neither car reached Rally's end. Kenneth set some top 10 stage times again, but would retire on stage 14 with a clutch issue. Alistair, meanwhile, had an atrocious time of it, retiring on stage 4 with a transmission failure. The first tarmac rally in Spain was next, and both cars had new engines. Its impact seemed limited. A turbo problem on stage 2 for McRae, with a replacement turbo meaning the car's anti-lag system couldn't be utilised. The engine though gave up the ghost entirely on stage 9, and the car suffered a puncture as well. Kenneth though would finish the rally, in 23rd place, 25 minutes off the leader. 
Argentina and there were some real signs of promise, with both cars getting to the end of the rally and in some decent positions as well, 7th and 8th for Alistair and Kenneth respectively. I mean the closest margin to the leader was 13 minutes, but like I say they got to the end in good positions on one of the most demanding stops of the season. That though didn't stop a different kind of horsepower getting in the way. Greece was next, yet another car mangling location, and so it proved to be. Engine failure for Kenneth on stage 4, punctures which progressively led to broken steering for Alistair on stage 6, and being retired for going over the time limit. There was optimism though for New Zealand, and the team were right to have it. A best finish of the season so far with Ericsson, 5th place, and only, if you want to call it that, 3 minutes and 12 seconds off the winner. McRae's pace was good too, despite a turbo boost issue, even collecting the fastest stage time on stage 18. However, he wouldn't be so fortunate in getting to the finish line, as on the way to the next stage, the front differential seized and the car couldn't get to service. It's almost as though the car itself couldn't believe what it had just done and needed some time to recuperate. Despite that setback though, real signs of potential for this car had come out. Had they finally turned a corner? Well, luckily for them, it was only the calm and relaxing event of Finland up next. Oh no, wait, I, I don't mean that, do I? Both cars got to the end of the rally, but the speed they had in New Zealand seemed to have disappeared. Finland is a much faster event than New Zealand, but even with the car's lack of grunt compared to the rest of the field, to be over 6 minutes off the winner's time does seem a bit disappointing. Those two weren't the only human days in the field. One of the leading Australian drivers at the time, Michael Guest, would also drive an accent, sporting a different livery. On stage 2 though, he would crash into a rock and lose heaps of time, leading him to claim 30th place. Cyprus was skipped, so the next destination was France. McRae finished 12th, but was struggling for front end grip, and lost 5th gear after the second stage, meaning a replaced gearbox was required. Ericsson though wouldn't get to finish the rally after colliding with a wall. San Remo in Italy was next. Very little information on the team's effort in this rally sadly, along with little footage. All I can say is that none of the accents scored points, with the best place car being McRae in 16th place. Australia though seemed to indicate a return to reasonable pace. Michael Guest was back again for his home rally, unfortunately though he would retire from the event after incurring issues earlier in the rally that included no brakes and getting stuck in third gear. McRae would also retire after breaking a suspension arm on stage 15, however that was after he and Ericsson were regularly setting times towards the front of the top 10, and in Ericsson's case collecting another couple of stage wins on his way to 4th overall and 2 minutes and 20 seconds off the winner. Ericsson said afterwards, First year with the car, many to learn this year, so it's looking very good for the future for this car, it has a lot of potential. On to the final rally in Wales, and McRae sounded optimistic for high nice chances. I'm not saying we'll be on for a win, but I like to think we should be able to push for a top 6 finish, and if we can get a clean run and set some really good times, then perhaps we can get on the podium. However, the optimism then fairly quickly faded away again. Ericsson had a new engine put into the car for this rally. It didn't last longer than midway through stage 4. Alistair also had engine problems, but not enough to the point of having to retire the car, even getting to the point of co-driver David Senior having to take his shirt off to try and stop oil flowing out of the engine. The car would get to the finish 6 minutes off the winner's time, in 11th position. At the end of the year, Hyundai finished 6th out of the 7 manufacturer backed efforts, scoring 8 points, the same as Skoda albeit Skoda competed in fewer rounds than the Korean brand. On the whole, it was not a brilliant season for the Accent WRC, although performances in New Zealand and Australia did indicate hints that they were at least making improvements. So will the driver lineup stay put on a continued path to further development? Well, not exactly. Particularly towards the end of the year, WRC's version of the silly season was heading in Hyundai's direction as well. Alistair would return, but Ericsson's future though was up in the air. You see, while Kenneth was an experienced pair of hands, all of his wins came on loose surfaces, however firmer surfaces were less of a strong suit. Motorsport developments were apparently keen on having a driver who could fulfil that side as well, thus potentially leaving Kenneth out of a ride, or potentially allowing him to retire. A fair few drivers were in with a shout including recently ousted Peugeot driver Francois Delacour, who had also recently tested the car during the year. But he wouldn't end up being there. 
So for 2001, Hyundai would be running Kenneth Ericsson for the loose surface rallies only. For the tarmac rounds, in comes experienced Italian driver Pierre Rogliati, someone who had driven for Subaru, Sat, and more recently Ford, and had also garnered one career victory up to this point. In readiness for the upcoming season, team principal David Whitehead had this to say. We're now armed with more experience, and we hope for our first podium to not be too far away. Up first, Monte Carlo, meaning it would be Liarty's first event with the team. On stage one, he set the fourth fastest time. On stage two, well, he wouldn't get to stage two as the accent lost oil pressure. Off to a wonderful start then. For McRae, the car's suspension had to be changed at the first service, causing 50 seconds worth of time penalties to be added. However, despite a tense moment with a rather solid wall, Asta kept going to finish in 7th place. On to Sweden, where Kenneth had returned, and returned to give the team a very hard-earned 8th place. Despite being 8 minutes off the leader, Kenneth said, The conditions were perfect on the stages, and the car also felt perfect all day. Whitehead, meanwhile, said, it's a testament to Kenneth's perseverance and the reliability and performance of the first generation Hyundai Accent ORC on its swan song event. Yes, you heard that right, it would be the last event for this particular edition of the Accent ORC. Although I'm not sure Alistair would be quite so pleased with the reliability of his accent, given that a broken turbo pipe would cost him and co-driver David Senior a fair amount of time, and then the engine itself let go on stage 7. Anyway, this new Accent WRC car thing was launched ahead of the next round in Portugal, among some very shiny lighting effects. Visually, nothing obviously different springs out, but the springs and the suspension were changed. That was a nice segue. Primarily for increased suspension travel, but according to the chief engineer Nick Clipson, 85% of the car has been revised, with the intention of not only making it faster, but also improving the reliability and serviceability. Furthermore, the engine was updated, and the body had been made more aerodynamic and aerodynamically stable. Although the changes didn't stop McRae having a big crash during testing. At least we now know MSD build a strong rally car. Those aren't my words, they're Alistair's instead. Either way, the new car's debut turned out to be pretty impressive, setting top 10 stage times throughout the rally, and perhaps more impressively, getting both cars to the finish pretty much trouble free on what was a particularly brutal Portuguese rally. 6th place for Alistair, 7th place for Kenneth. Tarmac returned, and so did Pierre Liarty. Although sadly he'd have probably wished he hadn't returned for this rally, as turbo issues plagued him early on in the event, and then a brake failure put him out of the event altogether. McCray meanwhile wasn't getting a whole lot of speed out of the car this weekend. For whatever reason, the Hyundai wasn't showing the same performance that it did in Portugal, and whilst he did get to the finish, 11th place would be the final result. In Argentina, however, the pace seemed to come back again. Not that the final results reflect that, though. Both Kenneth and Alistair were setting times that were consistently as close as the Hyundai's had gotten to their competitors. But the rough stages would bite for the accents. McCray's Hyundai would lose its tailpipe, with occasional fires having to be put out, thus leaving him in 9th place, whilst Kenneth had the same issue, before a wheel came off on a penultimate stage, resulting in a DNF. Cyprus showed some more signs of speed in what was an eventful three days. Unfortunately, further gremlins got in the way. Alistair suffered no less than three punctures early on in the rally. Kenneth was rather fortunate to escape this moment without a hitch. However, that may have used up all his luck. He'd gone as high as the podium places, but then a turbo pipe failure dropped him down the order. Seems to be a recurring issue with this car. Until the accent finally said enough is enough, with the alternator packing up. Alistair would run basically trouble free for the rest of the rally though, and whilst over 10 minutes off the leader, still scored 7th place. Liarty also appeared in this rally, but retired on stage 6 with an engine problem. In Greece, Alistair McRae suffered with turbo problems at the start of the rally, and so did Ericsson. Kenneth had it worse though later on, with the car losing power steering midway through one of the stages. He would ultimately retire though through turbo boost problems. Okay, I'm sorry, what is it with this car and issues with the turbo? McRae got to the end in 15th, 25 minutes off the winner. In Kenya, they didn't perform at all. As in, they didn't take part in the event. Not sure why, but that's what they did. But for the following round in Finland, they would expand to three cars, so they could make a guest appearance for a relatively unknown driver in Juha Kankanen. 
Oh, who am I kidding? A winner of an astounding 23 rallies with four World Rally titles to his name, it was a welcome return to the service park for the supremely talented Finn. Yuha said, I am delighted to be driving for Hyundai at my home event. The accent is a new challenge for me and we are hoping for a strong result. Teaming up with Kenneth and Alistair, Yuha would be the fastest driver of the three initially. Yuha's ride though would end on stage 16 after losing pretty much all braking ability. Sure, Finland is a fast rally, although some level of braking performance wouldn't go amiss. 12th and 13th for Kenneth and Alistair respectively at the finish. New Zealand, the site of one of last year's best performances for the original car. So would this one be better still? It would. In fact, by the end of the first day, Kenneth Eriksson would be in first place. Yes, I know that is perhaps a shock to the system, but Kenneth was doing some wondrous things. Although, it is worth pointing out that the Hyundais were starting at the lower end of the starting order, which meant that they had more preferable conditions to run in, which in turn meant that when Ericsson started the next day at the front of the starting order, he lost 2 minutes worth of time, and at the end of day 2, dropped to 11th place. Despite a puncture, Alistair would end the rally ahead of Ericsson in 9th and 10th respectively, with both over 3.5 minutes off the winner. But Kenneth didn't have any regrets regarding his day 1 pace and day 2 drop off. I have no regrets about being the first on the road as it felt fantastic to be leading a WRC rally for the first time in 4 years, and for the first time ever for Hyundai. As a piece of PR, it was very effective. However, even if the performance wasn't entirely reflective of the accent's true pace, the team did seem to be heading in the right direction. It was on to San Remo in Italy next, with Piero Liati coming back for his home rally. It was one to forget. One kilometre off the finish line of stage one, Liati crashed and retired from the event. McRae had an awful time of it as well, after having issues with the balance of the accent, Asta crashed and got stuck. Once rescued, they had to drive slowly for a few stages as the right rear lower control arm broke. Then later on, the brakes malfunctioned, putting them out of the rally as well. More asphalt goodness to come, this time in Corsica for the French rally, where the Hyundais were slightly better pace-wise, and basically ran the whole event flawlessly. The pace just wasn't there though. Liati 8th and McRae 9th, Liati being just under 8 minutes off the winner. Australia next, an event that the Hyundais did well in last year. However, whether the car had improved over last year is hard to tell, particularly as now, the starting order for the stages had changed. Changed in such a way that, basically, the Hyundais would start first, getting the worst of the conditions. That heavily compromised their result, 10th for McRae and 12th for Ericsson, both over 7.5 minutes off the winner. On to the final round in the UK, where Liati would be entered under a third entry for the team. He would retire through a transmission issue on stage 2. It would turn out to be his last round for the team. Out of the six events Liati did for the team, he finished one of them. This event would end much better for Kenneth and Alistair. Despite a power steering scare for McRae and a broken front differential for a period of time and some uncooperative windscreen wipers, he achieved the team's joint highest finish this season of fourth with Kenneth in 6th. Despite those results, Hyundai still finished the season bottom of the manufacturer standings. Clearly the car had gotten better, but not enough to truly fear the likes of Peugeot, Ford and Subaru etc. But several changes were afoot at Hyundai on the driver front. For a start off, Ericsson and McRae would be heading to Skoda and Mitsubishi respectively. In their places, Belgian driver Freddy Loix over from Mitsubishi, who had also driven for Peugeot and German Armin Schwartz from Skoda, who had one win to his name in his career. Whilst Juha Kankinen would also expand his schedule to do all the loose surface events. Here's what they all had to say. I'm very happy to be joining a team that is still so young and is eager to see success, which I am sure is not so far away. I am looking forward to a lot of development work, and while the car has proved it is reliable, I expect to be able to help improve its speed, said Freddy. I had a good look around in the Milton Keynes team base, and I was deeply impressed by their technical possibilities and the resources they have at their disposal, not to talk about the team members. All this gives me an incredible amount of optimism and confidence for next year. I can't wait to try my new car at the Monty Tests, said Armin. I'm very much looking forward to joining the team. Now I hope I can play an important role in strengthening the team in whatever way possible, said Yuha. 
So let's see if all of these drivers would be as happy by the end of the season. Uh, the yeah, about that, Monte Carlo begins the season again, and the Hyundai drivers were certainly pushing to the max. However, for Freddy Loix, the event would suddenly end in dramatic fashion. A terrible crash causing him to retire, as well as go to hospital for a fracture in his left foot. Then, just one stage later, on stage 4, Armin also crashed out and retired through suspension damage. Not a particularly rosy start, but never mind. Loix would be able to compete in Sweden, somehow, and we get to see Juha for the first time this season as well. Armin Schwartz cost himself time with this off, and then went off again later on. Not that any of this ultimately mattered though, he would suffer a transmission failure later on. Loix would have an incredible drive, climbing to as high as 4th, but a suspension failure would end his heroic performance. Kankanen would finish in 8th. On to France, where the team would have a third car once again, but it would be driven by Polish F2 rally champion Tomasz Kusza. The biggest change though was an evolution of the car. Now called the Hyundai Accent WRC3, the aesthetics on the outside still look pretty similar, but the changes according to Chief Engineer Nick Clipson include a revised engine specification with significantly lighter components, improved suspension geometry, improved steering and better cooling efficiency. There are also a multitude of weight saving improvements overall and the car has seen revisions to e-surfacing. So how effective would this be at finally getting the Hyundais to challenge for wins? Well, there's no easy way to put this, but on the shakedown, Freddy Loic suffered an off which damaged the intercooler. Kushar's debut with the accent lasted around a stage before a stuck throttle caused the brakes to catch fire. Schwartz would suffer a puncture and have a spin, and Loic's would stall, not helping his cause. Result-wise, it was Loic's in 9th, over 6 minutes off the leader, and Schwartz in 13th. In Spain for Rally Catalunya, a third car was supported by the Hyundai team once again, this time for Natalie Barrett, one of Britain's best female rally drivers of that period. Sadly, her rally would last until stage 6 with a mechanical issue. The other accents had a nylon trouble free run, but would both finish over 5 minutes off the leader. Loic's in 10th, Schwartz in 16th. Four accents were entered in Cyprus for Loic's, Schwartz, Kushar, and Kankanen. Kushar was 18 minutes off in 14th place through overheating setbacks. Kankanen retired on the road section to stage 5 with all sump issues. Loix would have a few issues before his retirement on stage 12 through a gearbox problem, including an airbox filter protector getting stuck in the filter itself. Schwartz had punctures to contend with throughout, but would show great fortitude and a good turn of speed, finishing in 7th. In Argentina, the team were looking to try and improve the consistency of shock absorber performance. In the case of Armin Schwartz, he'd have wanted some further analysis on improving the reliability of the fuel pump, which was after he suffered a broken wheel earlier in the rally. Loix had throttle issues and would then eventually tire through electrical gremlins. Kankanen did finish, but 8 minutes off in 7th place. Prior to the Acropolis rally, it was announced that Graham Moore would take the role of Chief Engineer, replacing Eclipson, who was leaving for personal reasons. For the event in Greece though, the accents were high on the leaderboard, sometimes setting the fastest stage times, although that may have been helped by better course conditions. However, Schwartz would be late out of service and had a spin, leaving him 5 minutes off in 9th place. Freddy Loix had a great first day, but after a few mistakes and then a large rock damaging the sump guard, his rally was over. Kankanen retired before Loix due to issues with the cars Oh no, not the Tiber again! The team would head to the Safari Rally in Kenya for the first time. This would be the roughest rally that the Accents would have competed in during its tenure, so a low finishing position wouldn't be a major surprise here. Although I think Loix and Schwartz would have at least hoped to have gotten to stage 2. Loix's clutch failed on stage 1, and Schwartz's alternator gave up on the way to stage 2. Kankana, meanwhile, would suffer a number of issues during the course of the rally including two broken rear shock absorbers and an engine that downgraded itself to three cylinders. But despite all of that, Yuha got to the finish, valuable data gathered towards an 8th place finish over 70 minutes of the winner. Except the Safari Rally wouldn't feature in next season's calendar. Brilliant! Finland was up next, and out of the three entries, one didn't make it to the finish. Take a guess at which one it was. I mean, we can rule out a crash from Yuha, as that's... Uh, oh, that's exactly what it was. Loix was 9th over 6 minutes off, 
Schwartz was 13th over 8 minutes off. A new event in Germany was next, but old reliability woes wouldn't go away. For likes, reasonable speed on the first day, despite the stall, would go for nothing due to engine issues. Schwartz though would be fairly error prone in his home rally, but this terrifying off would be where his rally ended. He suffered broken ribs from the crash, but would remarkably be back in action for the next round in San Remo, Italy. Unfortunately, less than 8 miles into the first stage of that event, and this impact would destroy one of the rear suspension arms, putting Armin out immediately. Loix wasn't happy with the setup of his accent, believing that the engine wasn't quite on son after having an issue during the shakedown stage. The issue? A turbo failure. However, he too would hit something hard enough to cause suspension damage. Whilst he would continue, Loix was just under 29 minutes off in 28th place. Back to gravel now with New Zealand, and for the first time this year, three accents would finish the rally in the top 10. But the closest car of Juha Kankunen was over seven minutes off the winner, although Schwartz's cause wasn't helped by this moment. Kankunen was fifth, Loix was sixth, and Schwartz was 10th. From one rally where all the Hyundais finished, to one where the exact opposite happened. Australia was one to very quickly forget, a stage win for Loix would come to nothing thanks to an off-camera accident. Schwartz's engine had had enough on stage 7, and on stage 24, so did Juha's, which was the last stage of the rally. Off to the UK for the last event of the season once again, and one where the team believed it was their best shot at getting a great result. But the pace just wasn't there again. Sadly, Armin's rally would end due to a fire although the reason given for their retirement was down to illness. Juha Kankanen and his co-driver Juha Repo stopped to help Schwartz and his co-driver Manfred Heimer, costing them a minute, although even with that, they still would have finished around 4 minutes off the winner, but still, it was a very noble thing to do from them. Loix would be 8th, and Juha 9th. Natalie Barrett would also get to the finish, despite the rear differential causing the accent to become quite tail-happy. Devastatingly though, it would turn out to be the last WRC event for her co-driver, Roger Freeman, who, along with driver Mark Lovell, would be killed in a terrible crash at a rally in Oregon in 2003. At season's end, Hyundai would get 4th place in the Manufacturers' Championship, despite the year they had. Mind you, it was only by a single point. That being said though, team principal David Whitehead seemed quite happy with where the car was at. This year has shown that the team, the drivers and the accent have the agility, durability and speed to take the fight to the leading teams, and we expect to be challenging for the top 5 placings on a regular basis. Our improving performance after only 3 years in the WRC category is a testament to the dedication and skills of everyone in the team, and in particular to the drivers who have helped us develop the car to the point where we can take on the Fords and Subarus. The team would be downsizing to 2 cars for the majority of 2003, but would still have a third one available for selected rallies. Loix and Schwartz were confirmed to be returning, but Yuha Kankinen would not be. Although it was later announced that at selected events, an up-and-coming Finnish talent in UC Valimaki would drive a third accent. Paul Risbridger of Motorsport Development said, We are confident that the Accent WRC3 is the right car to tackle the variety of events planned for 2003, and we look forward to working closely with him throughout the programme. So without any further delay, let's crack on with a fourth season talking about this Hyundai. Although the car was sporting a new livery, mainly because Castrol were now no longer associated with the team, and a new deal with Shell hadn't been finalised yet, meaning the budgets were starting to get thin. Monte Carlo to start off with, you know the drill by now, and just like last year, Loix was not enjoying this event. A small spin and then an off slightly further on were the least of his concerns. This collision, plus slow slide down the hillside, put him out of the rally. Schwartz was fighting to keep control at certain points, but would at least finish. 8th place, picking up a solitary point. But he was over 6.5 minutes off the winner. The team didn't do a whole lot of testing, which may have explained why the team struggled to find a setup that worked. There were doubts that the accents would even appear in Sweden, but they would do so. Albeit they hadn't done much testing for this round either. The fast snowy stages and the car's engine not being one of the best in the field ultimately showed. Schwartz's engine though was even less effective at some points, with his engine dropping down a few cylinders whenever the boost kicked in. 
leaving him 13th. Loix's car was reliable, but didn't have the speed. 10th place for him, 3.5 minutes off. In UC's first event with the team, a transmission failure would put him out on stage 7. Once again, rumours were going around that the team would pull out, but they would enter the new event in Turkey with two cars as scheduled. Luckily, the accents did seem to be a little bit faster on these stages. The bad news, however, was that the reliability was still an issue. Both cars had suspension problems initially. Armin's car had an exhaust problem which let out some smoke and meant the team at the service park couldn't sort out the suspension problems in time. Whilst Freddy's car suffered a broken turbo, yep, that pesky thing once again, and the throttle stuck open briefly. Armin's suspension then gave up to the point of being forced to retire. Loix would finish down in 10th, but also finish down on power as well. New Zealand was... not good. Like, not good at all. The team had brought in some engine modifications, including a new turbo, along with some testing prior to the rally, but also one of Hyundai's Korean directors travelled to the event. Obviously, you want to put on a particularly good performance with that in mind. The last thing you want to have happen is for all three cars to crash out of the rally, which is what happened. Firstly, Armin Schwartz, then UC Valimaki off camera, and finally, also off camera, Freddy Loix. I think with that, we'd ought to move on to Argentina. Although Freddy's rally would end early once again due to electrical issues in the engine. Schwartz had the awkward job of rallying with his door open for a brief period of time, but he too would retire with engine problems. On to Greece, with four entries this time Loix, Schwartz, Valimaki, and Austrian driver Manfred Stoll. And Stoll would be the only accent to get to the end. Schwartz's engine gave up after a cam belt was broken due to a loose stone, Loix had suspension problems, whilst the clutch went in Valimaki's car. Then in Cyprus, reliability struck the accents yet again. First to retire was another Hyundai debutant, former British rally champion Justin Dale, with an overheating engine. Then Freddy's car suffered an engine failure caused by dust. Schwartz's engine was also overheating, but thankfully he managed to at least get to the finish, and collect the team's first points since the opening round, with a 7th place finish. The team would enter 4 cars in Germany, but all would suffer problems throughout the rally prior to them finishing, so at the very least they all finished. Loix had a throttle issue, Schwartz had gearbox gremlins, Stoll had transmission issues, whilst Dale hit one of the German rally's notorious concrete blocks. Loix was the best placed accent, in 11th place, just under 5 minutes off the winner. Finland now, and the signs were somewhat more encouraging from a reliability standpoint. Whilst not setting the world alight with speed, Loix and Schwartz would get to the end of the event, in 10th and 12th respectively, albeit in Loix's case, over 8 minutes off the winner. Valimaki could have potentially gotten to the end as well, had it not been for this crash on stage 19. Then it was on to Australia, where things had shuffled around at the team. Stoll and Dale were scheduled to take part, but ultimately didn't, leaving Schwartz and Loix to compete in a two-car effort. Graham Moore had also resigned as the senior event engineer, with the technical aspect of the team now being headed up by chief designer Mark Way and engineer Graham Garvin. Meanwhile, Loix was confirmed to be joining Peugeot in 2004. For Australia, the team ran reasonably smoothly, reliability seemingly improving once again, but the speed was still not there. Loix was the best performing accent in 8th place, seven minutes off the winner. Then it was off to Italy for the San Remo rally. Or at least, that was what was originally meant to happen. Prior to the event, Hyundai announced that they'd be pulling out of the WRC at the end of the season. They said in a statement, withdrawing is a painful decision, but also a realistic admission that a break is absolutely mandatory for us to reorganize and rethink our entire approach to motorsport. But we'll be back in 2006 in fighting form with a completely new engine and car to mount a more credible challenge for the WRC crown. The company had planned to make new rally headquarters in Germany and would join midway through 2006 and then a full campaign in 2007. However, they would still be aiming to complete the rest of 2003. And then this came out. Not long after the announcement, Motorsport Developments, the team that ran the operation for Hyundai, sent staff members home as a result of a 
contractual dispute. Hyundai said that MSD had provided audited financial records to them, but still wanted to complete the remainder of the season. Motorsport Developments announced that they would not be entering San Remo. They explained their absence with the following statement. Despite protracted discussions with the Hyundai Motor Company over the past week, the Hyundai Motor Company has failed to pay Motorsport Developments the contracted payments necessary for it to participate in the remaining rounds of the 2003 World Rally Championship. MSD has done nothing to justify HMC withholding any contractual payments. MSD has always provided HMC with financial information as contractually required. As of the start of the San Remo Recce, MSD had not received any commitment from the Hyundai Motor Company with respect to MSD's latest proposal to resolve the contractual differences between the two parties. As a result, Hyundai World Rally Team will miss the San Remo Recce. Furthermore, MSD and its drivers, Freddie Loix and Armin Schwartz, will not consider starting the San Remo Rally without having participated in the recce on the grounds of safety. MSD remains hopeful that a resolution for the remaining three events will be reached soon. However, the following round in Corsica, France was also skipped, with the relationship seemingly deteriorating between motorsport developments and Hyundai. Managing Director of MSD David Whitehead said, The simple fact is that Hyundai has failed to honour its payment obligations to MSD, and we cannot continue if we do not get paid. Hyundai has no contractual basis whatsoever to withhold any payments from us. I can only assume Hyundai had no intention to complete the programme despite its assurances in the past, it is my absolute resolve to take this all the way to the courts so that the situation can be put right. My lawyers are currently preparing the case from which the record will be set straight. I am saddened by the manner in which this program is finished, and in particular I would like to pay tribute to the 100 staff who have been made redundant despite doing an excellent job in very difficult circumstances. I would also like to extend my thanks to the suppliers and drivers who have stood by the team in this trying period. In my 28 years of motorsport, I have never come across a situation like this, where the departure of a manufacturer from a major motorsport championship has been executed so poorly, causing such damage and ill feeling within the sport. It truly is unprecedented. Things were clearly not rosy whatsoever. Freddie said about the situation, If you don't have money, you can't start. But for a works team, this situation is outrageous. When Freddie replaced Richard Burns at Peugeot for the final rally in the UK due to Richard's blackout prior to the event, Freddie had this to say, There's no comparison with my previous Hyundai Accent. The car is much more agile, and the engine is extremely powerful. The Accents from MSD were then sold to a Czech team. Afterwards, information regarding MSD and Hyundai was practically non-existent for a long period of time, but there does seem to be a conclusion to this feud. According to information found online, it appears that Hyundai did pay MSD £1.8 million, although this was a settlement through an arbitration, in essence meaning that neither side technically wins in this scenario. What MSD did was sell their cars and tools to help fund the case against Hyundai, which could have gone wrong for them had they not have ultimately received any money from this case. The Accent would still have a small presence in the WRC through privateer teams in 2004, including through UC Valimaki, who managed to get a points finish in Mexico, which was far better than what he achieved in his factory-backed Hyundai stint, as he retired from all the rallies he did in 2003 with them. However, in essence, the Accent's journey in rallying from a factory point of view was over, and Hyundai wouldn't compete as planned in 2006 or 2007. They would return though in 2014, like I said earlier, where they have been much more competitive since. Ultimately though, this was just a terribly sad way to end the programme the way it did. But even with these less than ideal circumstances in regards to how it ended, this effort just never made any decent headway. A big issue was the engine, which never seemed to be quite up with the likes of Peugeot, Ford or Subaru, and was where a lot of the car's time was lost. The suspension is also one where the team was really struggling to make progress with, particularly in the early stages of development. In fact, the only positives that I've been able to find with the car whilst researching it was how the accent was quite predictable with a nice balance and had good traction. But the car didn't ever develop to a point where it was really a contender for regular top 5 finishes on pure pace alone. Then of course there was the reliability, which was just horrendous. Not to mention how the last year was impacted by a lack of testing due to budgetary reasons. Although, was this doomed from the very beginning? 
Was the Accent just not a particularly good platform with which to create a competitive rally car? Irrespective of that, and how the car is fondly remembered by people, particularly through Gran Turismo 4, the reality is that this was not a successful project whatsoever, no matter what accent you put it across in. That though is thankfully going to be it for this video, thank you very much for watching and indeed for getting to the end as well, it was certainly very exhaustive that's for sure, unless you skip straight to this part, which to be honest I don't blame you for doing so. However, before you click off, if you did enjoy this video, then I would be enormously appreciative if you did hit the like and subscribe button, as this video has taken a very long time to do. Hence why I'm also sorry for the lack of regular uploads recently, which should hopefully return to a more normal schedule in the near future. In the meantime, what are your thoughts on the Hyundai Accent WRC car? Plus, what forgotten racing projects would you like to see me do videos on? say in the comment section down below. With all that being said though, until the next video, be kind to each other and enjoy the rest of your day.